Island Crimes and Mysteries with Newells. Hey guys, welcome to Ireland Crimes and Mysteries, the podcast channel that takes you on a journey through the dark and mysterious side of Ireland's history. From infamous crimes to unsolved mysteries, we explore the stories that have captivated and intrigued people to this very day. Join us as we uncover the stories behind these cases. Whether you're a true crime enthusiast or a lover of all things mysterious, this is the podcast for you. So sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee, and let's explore the dark side of Ireland together. This podcast has been compiled from information gathered in the public sphere, like news articles and documentaries. Everything in this podcast is alleged unless a conviction has taken place. In the early hours of the 4th of September 1999, Sarah Murray was in a taxi with her friends on the way home from a night out in Dublin City. The taxi dropped her off at the end of the road near her house on Silchester Avenue. On leaving the taxi, she noticed something on the ground in the distance on the tree-lined walkway known locally as the Cut, leading to her home. The Cut connected Silchester Road with Silchester Park. She immediately got a bad feeling as she recognised the clothes of the person laying there. As she moved closer, she was horrified to realise it was her 17-year-old sister, Raynard. She ran over and tried to wake her sister. It was then she noticed the blood. Her friend who was a nurse told Sarah to run home and get help while she tried to help Raynard. As she checked for a pulse, she soon realised it was a hopeless situation. Raynard had succumbed to her injuries. Raynard Murray, or Rainey as she was affectionately known, was born on the 6th of January 1982 to her parents, Jim and Deirdre Murray. She grew up in Glenageary in South Dublin. Glenageary is a suburb of the Dunleary Ratdown area of Dublin and is surrounded by well-known coastal villages like Kalini and Dawkey. It is approximately 10 kilometres from Dublin city centre and has a bus and train service to the city. The youngest of three children, Raynard had an older brother and an older sister. She went to school at St. Joseph of Cluny in Kalini and completed her leaving certificate in June 1999. She intended on resitting her leaving cert in Leeson Street, Dublin, in the new term to secure the course she wanted in University College, Dublin. She wanted to pursue a career in writing. Although she had done well in the leaving cert, she hadn't secured the points needed for her desired course. In the meantime, Rain had worked as a junior sales assistant in the Sally West Boutique in Dunleera. Sally West was a fashion boutique where the manager described Raynard as angelic. She said she was tall with long blonde hair, big blue eyes and the personality to match. She said Raynard was very well mannered and they had even joked about it at work with her. She worked flexi time and was loving the extra bit of cash her summer job afforded her. On her CV for her job application, she wrote about her love of reading and writing, stating Dylan Thomas's poem Under Milkwood as her favourite. Raina hung around with an alternative crowd who were into the grunge scene and loved bands like Nirvana. They called themselves the Dunleera Crew. They would hang out at a secluded spot at the local beach known as the Temple in Black Rock. These were rooms that were cordoned off from public access. Because it was not frequented by the general public, it was an ideal location for the teenagers to hang out and just be teenagers. The only interruption was the occasional bust by the Gardaí who would break up the party and confiscate any alcohol. They would sit around playing music and Rain had played the acoustic guitar. She loved music. She particularly loved George Michael. Her close friend was teaching her a new song at the time called Think. She loved to wear bell bottoms and sported a blue stud in her nose. Despite being described by some as a goth, her friend said she never actually wore black and was always seen in bright colours. A popular member of the group, Rainid was somebody who her peers went to for advice. 
Although a little naive, she was known for her sound advice and listening ear by her friends. One friend described her as very soft and very kind-hearted, while another said she was friendly and really good-looking. They all agreed that life for Enid was typical of any teenager of the time, with hers revolving around friends and family, nights out and her summer job. Like a lot of teenage groups that hung out together, there were different personalities within the group. One girl in particular was very jealous of the other girls. Some were wary of her and often described her as psychotic, as she could be prone to violent outbursts. But overall, they didn't take her too seriously. After finishing school, the Dunleary crew was more or less disbanded as they went their separate ways. Rain had kept contact with her close friends, who she would socialise with on nights out. That day, the 3rd of September 1999, was a particularly warm and balmy day, and Rainit had planned to journey into the city to register at Leeson Street, but slept in. It was too late to make the journey into the city and be back in time for work. She rang the Institute of Education from her workplace and rearranged to register the following Monday. Needless to say, Rainid was relieved she hadn't missed registration because of sleeping in. She could now look forward to the weekend as it was her dad's birthday. Rain had planned to buy her dad a birthday present with her wages, which would double as a congratulations present. Her dad had recently made principal at the local boys' school. A fancy pen was her gift of choice. Later that afternoon, Rain had took an hour's break and walked up to her friend's house. This friend would later walk her back to the Sally West boutique. On her return to the boutique, she was given a key to the shop, which was a very proud moment for Rainid, as it gave her a sense of responsibility and achievement. The manager there obviously thought highly enough of her to give her such responsibility, opening and locking up the boutique. Later that afternoon, Rainid's mother called in. Rainid had earlier rang her to tell her that there was a great sale on and there was lots of good bargains to be had. By the time she arrived, Rainit had discarded her platforms and was in her bare feet, as her feet were killing her. She wanted to buy a new outfit for Rainid's dad's birthday, so she decided to go and check out the sale. So she left work early and popped into the shop. They had great fun picking out outfits and her mother trying them on. Her mother holds these memories very close to her heart. She recalls Rainid's last words to her being, Bye ma'am, I'll see you later. Little did she know it would be the last encounter she'd ever have with her beloved youngest child. After her shift ended at 9pm, Rainid went to Scott's pub on Georgia Street, Dunleary, a pub Rainid knew well. She often went there to meet friends for a drink after work. This was the last place Rainid was seen alive. She left the pub at approximately 11.20pm, having made plans to meet her friends after midnight. She wanted to go home and change as she was still in her work clothes. She also wanted to get some money for the night out. Georgia Street was buzzing that night with a late summer vibe, so Rainid would not have felt uncomfortable walking through the familiar streets and laneways on the 15-minute walk home, which she did regularly. Walking home from work and nights out on the town. As I stated before, it was a warm, balmy late summer's night. A bit of fog had accumulated, which did add an air of eeriness to these laneways and tree-lined walkways. But this was known as a safe area. One of Rainid's friends who had arranged to meet her outside the Dunleary shopping centre at 10 minutes to midnight had rang her house shortly after midnight to see where she was, but her dad had answered the phone, so she hung up, thinking she had woke him up. Little did she know, but Rainid had never even reached her house. One witness in a car explained that they had seen a girl fitting Rainid's description having a verbal altercation with a young man in his 20s on the walk along Glenageary Road before midnight. What caused this delay as she had made arrangements with her friends to meet just after midnight? Around this time a group of friends in a back garden heard a female voice shouting Leave me alone and F off followed by a scream and then silence. They assumed it was a couple arguing and didn't think any more of it. 
Reynad would later be found by her sister at 12.32am on that shortcut only 50 yards from their home. On her friend's instruction, Sarah had ran home to alert her parents, who dashed to the scene. But Reynad's wounds were so severe, it was clear she was beyond help. They immediately contacted the Gardaí. The area was searched with haste for the assailant, but they were long gone, escaping under the cover of darkness. Clues were scarce at the crime scene, but the grass beside the footpath was covered in a large amount of blood, which made it likely this was where Reynad was attacked. They followed a blood trail about 200 feet from the grass along the path. Reynad had tried desperately to make it home, but she was fatally injured and collapsed 50 yards from her house. There was no evidence of sexual assault and nothing had been stolen from Reynad. Her wounds were so severe and the attack so violent, it was theorised that the assault was personal and not a random attack. She had been stabbed over 30 times according to her autopsy. The majority of her wounds were superficial, but at least four were fatal. These were wounds to her chest, her side, her shoulder and the stab wound to her armpit had severed a main artery, causing her to bleed out. The Gardaí believed it was a butcher-style knife or a catering knife that was used. Reynad had fought hard for her life, the autopsy revealed, sustaining many defensive wounds. A large amount of blood at the scene indicated without doubt the assailant had to be covered in blood. DNA found under her fingernails was also recovered. This could have potentially belonged to her attacker, but could also have belonged to someone else, as she would have had close contact with a lot of people through her work as a sales assistant at the boutique and at the bar that night. This would have been taken into account when the DNA profile was complete. The Gardaí had so little to go on from the scene. No prime suspect was glaringly obvious. The family made an impassioned appeal for help and implored people with any information to get in touch with the Gardaí. Raina's funeral took place on the 7th of September 1999 in St. Joseph's Church in Glastool and she was buried in Shangara Cemetery. There was a massive turnout at her funeral. Everyone was still in shock but turned up to show their support for her devastated family. Meanwhile, several people did come forward with information. One lady said she saw a young man in his 20s running on the road away from the laneway where the murder had occurred. But this lead came to nothing. With little to go on, the Gardaí decided to investigate her old friends in the Dunlira crew a little deeper. A few of the gang felt that they were unfairly interrogated initially and treated like suspects. This made them nervous. They felt the nature of the questioning was accusatory from the start. Because of this, they felt what they had to say wasn't taken too seriously by the Gardaí. Some had voiced concerns about the psychotic friend and her aggressive behaviour at times. Special attention was given to her when the Gardaí began to look a little deeper into the Dunleary crew. The fact that there were so many superficial wounds on Reynad meant the Gardaí could not rule out the possibility that her attacker was female. It had been said that this girl's boyfriend had an obsession with Reynad, which made the girl jealous of her. But this has not been proven. It was also believed that on the night of the murder, this girl had been in Scott's pub or had arranged to meet the friends later at the nightclub. Another confusing fact was that she had alerted friends about Reynad's murder the next morning, before it had even been confirmed that the body found was Reynad's. Both her and her boyfriend deny any involvement in the murder, and she now lives abroad. Other friends in the crew also had reservations about a young guy Reynad had met in the nightclub two months prior to her murder. Despite the fact he came across as nice and friendly, her friends felt unnerved by him. That night, after their first meeting at the club, they left together and went to Abracababra and appeared to be getting on. They later left the restaurant together. Later, in the early hours, Raina had appeared at her friend's apartment in a very distraught and anxious state. She said someone had followed her and it had frightened her. 
The friend rang for a taxi to take Rain at home as she was afraid to walk. They never discussed it after that night. A young man in his late teens, early twenties of slender build with sandy messed up hair and wearing light coloured combats was how she had described him. Practically the same description as that given by the witness who saw her and a young man on Glenageary Road before midnight on the night of her murder. Two sketches were released to the public of this young man. One with messed up hair and one with spiky hair. A taxi man had also come forward saying he had picked up a young man with blood on his pants near Scott's Bar in the early hours of that Saturday morning. But the description did not fit that of the young man seen with Raynard and Gardy initially dismissed this information, convinced he was someone else. But when no leads were panning out, they decided to carry out door-to-door inquiries in the area the taxi had dropped him off. But nobody knew him and the people in the house he had been dropped at by the taxi said they did not know him and said no one called that night. A sketch with his description was released to the public and many people came forward saying they had seen him at the nightclub that night, but no one could say who he was. This man would later be identified as a chef working in the city. He was in possession of a kitchen knife when located by the Gardaí. He had a criminal record for sexual assault and was a heroin user with a violent temper, but nothing could link him to Raynard's murder despite an alleged jailhouse confession stating he had killed her because she refused to have sex with him. He would later go on to deny that he had said any of this. He also had a flimsy alibi. A call had been made to director inquiries from his apartment on the night of the murder. It could not be proven it was him who had made the call, nor could it be disproven, but it did cast doubt on his involvement and Gardy had no solid evidence to arrest him. The bloodstained pants were never located, so all they had was the taxi driver's word. Throughout the investigation, more persons of interest would arise, but subsequent inquiries would lead nowhere. No evidence was found to link any of these suspects to the murder. One of note was a man named Farah Swalla Noor, who would be a victim of murder himself years later by the infamous Scissor Sisters. Allegedly, during an altercation, Noor threatened their mother by shouting, I'm going to F and kill you, just like I did Raynard Murray. Their mother told Gardy he had said this to her on at least two occasions that he had killed Raynard. He was questioned at the time but Gardy concluded he was making the whole thing up and he was only trying to frighten his girlfriend. Over the years Gardy have made little headway in progressing the investigation. There have been over 3,500 witness statements and 12 arrests made, all ending up being released. No DNA matches have been found for the DNA under Raynard's fingernails. There have been over 200 persons of interest and most remain that to this day. But no one has been charged with Raynard's murder. Over 22 suspects have been flagged in a Garda cold case review and are still being monitored. A full incident room is set up in the Dunleary Garda station to this day. A cold case review took over two years to complete. Every year the family plead with the public for information to bring the killer to justice but their pleas so far have not helped bring this nightmare to an end. The family received a letter of condolence on the fifth anniversary of Raynard's murder. The person stated Gardy had already interviewed the killer earlier on in the investigation but had dismissed him. This letter was investigated and traced back to the chef in the taxi. He was brought in for questioning. After a lengthy interrogation, it was determined he had written the letter to deflect suspicion away from himself. A tribute website for Raynard was set up in 2009, 10 years on from her murder, for people to leave their condolences or messages for the family. It was also hoped that people might use it as a way of leaving new information but the website had to be shut down as trolls left hurtful and insulting messages about Raynard and her murder. Understandably, this upset the family deeply. An American criminal profiler was employed by the Gardaí to compile a profile of the killer. 
He profiled the murderer as a single young man who either lived alone or with his mother. Socially inept with few to no friends. He could possibly suffer from mental health issues or have a drug addiction. He also stated it was highly likely he would kill again. Raynard's murder casts a long shadow in recent Irish history. The fact that no one has been arrested for her murder is an uneasy thought. The violence of the attack, no motive ever been established for her murder and no similar attacks in the area since lends credence to the theory that the attack was personal rather than random. But who would commit such a heinous crime? Did her pleasant personality and popularity cause jealousy in someone she knew, leading them to murder her in a jealous rage? Or was she just in the wrong place at the wrong time and it was a crime of opportunity? Either way, this has become one of Ireland's largest murder investigations to date and still so many questions and no real answers 24 years on. In 2019, on the 20th anniversary of her death, the family made a statement saying that she had died on the pavement with no loving, caring person with her to help or comfort her. Her dad said that Raynard's killer was free that this freedom mocked what should have been Raynard's life and still mocked the horror of her death. He made an appeal directly to her killer saying, come out from the shadows and own up to what you've done. Do the right thing and confess to your crime. He went on to say that it was 20 years since Raynard had been murdered, but to them her awful death was still as vivid in their minds and the pain of her loss was still as strong every day. He went on to say, quote, The Gardaí have assured us of their continuing commitment to bring Raynard's killer to justice, but they need your help. We are appealing for anyone with information that could be relevant to the inquiry to come forward with it to the Gardaí. He noted that there were reports at the time of people in the area, but that some of them hadn't come forward. On the 22nd anniversary of her murder, Gardaí made a fresh appeal for information stating, quote, Many of those who were then Raynard's age are now parents themselves, some of whom may have children who are close to Raynard's age. We would ask them to reflect now, with the benefit of maturity and hindsight, on any information which may be of assistance to the investigation. If any person has any information which could assist the Gardaí in identifying a motive for the murder of Raynard, and if any person has any doubts about the truth of an alibi already provided, we would appeal for your immediate assistance. You may unknowingly be shielding a killer. The solving of this murder is of utmost priority for Angarda Siakana, and any information received will be treated with absolute confidentiality. A reward of €190,000 has been collected for any information leading to an arrest. If you have any information, no matter how insignificant you think it is, please call the Garda Confidential Helpline on 1800 666 111 or call Crime Stoppers on 1800 250 025 or alternatively email nbci.scrt at garda.ie. So guys, thanks for joining me on Ireland Crimes and Mysteries today. I hope you enjoyed exploring the darker side of Ireland with me. If you have any suggestions for future episodes or would like to share your thoughts on the cases we've covered, please feel free to leave a comment. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel to stay up to date for all my latest episodes. Until our next investigation, keep your eyes open and your mind curious. You've been listening to Island Crimes and Mysteries with Nils. Join us for another episode coming real soon.